Hello, we welcome you to Trinity Lutheran Church. We're located at North 530 Northwest 4th Street in Faribault, Minnesota. Today we're recording our service on Saturday evening because the church has a special order of service and only one service on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And we'd invite you to come down to the church at 10 o'clock this morning and uh, visit us for our Polka Festival. Today we'll be using the Office of Vespers. Our pastor today is our pastor Michael Nerva. Our organist this evening will be Nancy Simonson. Pastor Nerva will be speaking on Spending Eternity with God based on 2 Corinthians 5. Our hymns this evening, number 905 in the Lutheran Service Book, Come Thou Almighty King. Our office hymn will be For Me to Live is Jesus, number 742 in the Lutheran Service Book. And we'll close our service with number 704 in the Lutheran Service Book, Renew Me, O Eternal Light. We ask you now to join us as we open our service with our opening hymn, number 905 in the Lutheran Service Book, Come Thou Almighty King. my lips make haste O oh God to deliver me
Psalm 124, we read responsively. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say. Then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. First reading from the fourth Sunday after Pentecost is from Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord answered Job of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by word without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds, its garments, and thick darkness, its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no further. Here shall your proud ways be stayed. This is word of the Lord. Second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. For you know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk in faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. We begin reading at verse 35. On that day, when the evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving crowd, they took him with them in the boat, 
just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? O Lord, have mercy on us. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name, that I may walk in your truth. <laughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Please be seated for our office hymn, For Me to Live is Jesus, hymn 742. Please join with me in prayer. O oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, grant to us a living faith as we give you thanks for the eternal life which is ours in Jesus Christ, that we are saved by faith alone in what he has done for us. 
and help us then to be grateful all our days for all the gifts that you give to us, that you pour upon us without a wor mer merit or worthiness on our part. In this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have our lesson tonight. It comes to us, of course, from 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. I especially am going to give you just the first few verses of that. As we look at it, really, probably the first four. Now, if you look at it, the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that what we are living in, literally our earthly body, is a tent. I find that to be a very interesting image that the Apostle Paul gives. I mean, the Apostle Paul, although he at one time was a great and powerful Pharisee, one of the people who was, of course, we would say the big shots, they had a lot of money, they were the ones who determined what was right and wrong based on the interpretation of the law of Moses in Jerusalem, that he had lost it all. He had lost it all when Jesus came to him, as we know in Acts 9, and the light blinded him, he fell off his horse. And Paul then, baptized in the city of Damascus, became no longer Saul, but Paul. Now, what do you do? <clears throat> I'd like to think, of course, that as we find in Scripture also, he's a tent maker. Along with Aquila and Priscilla, now he's making tents. Now, before the days of industrialization, you, you made them by hand. So when he talks about what we have in front of us in our lesson of 1 Corinthians 5, he knows well what he's talking about a tent. He says, your earthly body is a tent. Now, if you thought about that carefully, tents are temporary. If you're going out camping, well, you live in a tent. Now, a tent, of course, is not very comfortable. Maybe some of you like camping on the weekend. Maybe some of you actually are a diehard and you own a tent. But would you like to live there all the time? In the woods, with the mosquitoes. It'd be really hard because it's temporary. I mean, my idea of camping, by the way, is going to the Holiday Inn and turning on the air conditioning and having someone else make my bed while I swim in the pool. A tent itself doesn't actually do anything. It just is just very flimsy. You can't hang a pitcher on the tent. You really can't plug in your TV in the tent, can you? There's nothing there. Paul's really saying something about this idea that your body is a tent. And what's more, if you think about the idea of a tent, it's also insecure. It says in the scripture, while we're in this tent, we groan being burdened. Now, if we're in a tent, of course, think about what else that means. It's a great image. If you're out in the woods, you can't bar the gate against the bear. The bear will come in and find you. Yet, have you ever seen a bear come to a tent and say, Oh, I can't get in. It's zipped up. Does not happen. And what's more, if you're in a raging storm and the tornado is bearing down on you, you wouldn't want to be in a tent. I like that because Paul really understands. Now the point, as our scripture says, he says we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building of God not made with human hands. Eternal in the heavens. I mean, I think there's a problem. So many people live in this earth in this tent of a body that they think that this is all there is. Paul says it's temporary. First of all, we find that it's temporary in that our life is not going to last. It says in 1 Samuel 20, verse 3, I am a step away from death. No one may want to think about that, but death comes to all people, not just to so-called old people, and that definition of old people gets to be a little bit different the older you get. Certainly it was different the older I get. And you find that death can happen to young, to old alike. 
And if you live in a body which is a tent, it's not going to last long. Oh, if you live to be 80, 84, 94, well, good. But you'll never make 244 in the modern era. The tent of which you live in is going to go. It's going to wear out. It's just not going to be the same. And what's more, we find that as long as we're living in a tent, when we do die, well, all the stuff that we've accumulated, where does it go? All the money that people accumulate, where does it go? All the priceless knickknacks we have in our shelves, where do they go? Well, does Job say, naked I came into this world, and naked I will leave. You can't take it with you. It's true. And yet, for some odd reason, people still try to stuff their tent with everything they can, thinking there's a possibility that it'll change. And it never does. It never does anything. And yet, the idea is, I think, that we really have to understand this, is that although our life is temporary here, that we who are the Christian we can understand what the Apostle Paul is saying that there is a place for us. Oh yes, here as he says in verse 4, which I read to you, we're being burdened. I mean, what kind of burdens do you carry? What kind of problems will you face in this world? What troubles are already there for you? All sorts of things can happen. If you live in something that's insubstantial, that does not have a solid promise of a future... You could have financial trouble. You could lose your health. You could lose the most horrible thing of all. You could have your children die ahead of you, which I think would be a curse. You could have all sorts of things happen. And they do happen. And yet people are always surprised when they do. What part about original sin don't people get? That people are mortal. People have troubles. Even Job said, as people are born, their troubles fly up like sparks. Constantly we're in danger. Constantly we're immortal. Constantly there's a possibility that things will fall apart. And yet if we're burdened, as I say, the hope is found in Jesus. And that's what faith does. It trusts. Oh, eyes might see the prowling lion. Faith will see Daniel's angel. Eyes will see the storms. But faith sees Noah's rainbow. Eyes see the giants. Faith see the promised land. Eyes see your faults. But your faith sees your Savior. Your eyes might see your guilt, but your faith sees his blood. For he died for you. Your eyes might see your grave, but your faith sees a city whose builder and maker is God. Your eyes may look in the mirror and see a sinner, a failure, a promise breaker, but by faith you look in the mirror and you see a robed prodigal wearing the ring of grace on his finger and the kiss of your father on your face. And there is the good news that we are strangers and pilgrims on earth. We're just traveling and we're coming to this better place. We're traveling to the eternal city of which we look forward to, the place that God has made for us. It tells us so in John 14, verse 2. God prepares a place for us. And I think that you could make that very personal. God makes a place for you. Some people I know are always frightened by heaven. They're frightened of a God, what he might do. After all, if God knows everything, then what can I hide from him? The good news is that when you believe in Jesus, when we're covered with the blood of Christ, he sees you as perfect. He sees you as being his son, his daughter. He says that there's a place for you. Now I know, furthermore, people are unhappy with the idea of heaven. You know, I wish I had a quarter for everyone who told me, I don't want to be in heaven, I'd rather be in hell. And the reason why, I asked them, 
because all my friends will be in hell. I won't know anyone in heaven. Surprising how that comes up all the time. And I tell them, you will not be happy in hell. That's not an eternal place you're going to be happy with. Your friends are not going to be happy. They'll be depressed. You'll be in agony. The worm does not die. There's weeping. There's gnashing of teeth. It's a terrible place. Well, even Jesus compared it to Gehenna. Gehenna was a great garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. I don't know how you feel about burning garbage all the time. It smells horrible. And there's rats the size of pickle jars. In and out. No one wants to live in a dump like that. Not even with your friends. Well, in descriptive, it would say you don't have to be there. For everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for them will be saved. Absolutely. In this place called heaven. Oh yes, the earthly tent will give out, but this place which is eternal. Now, you will have all those things really in this world of which you will probably enjoy. My advisor for my doctoral dissertation said that his idea of heaven was like a large library of the Reformation. And all the books will be in one place. Well, good luck with that. But think of all the good things you've had here on earth. And think of all that God's promising in heaven. It tells in the Psalms there are pleasures in his right hand even forevermore. Things like that of earth. But things like that you have not seen. I mean, if someone loves their pup tent too much. And they've only lived in a tent all their life. How amazed would they be if they saw the Taj Mahal? Or they saw some huge building which was beautiful. Here's what God declares. Here's this huge place which is made for you. And I think we have to realize that when we have that great understanding of salvation by faith, that should actually help us. I mean, think about what is there. The Apostle Paul, who is also author of our lesson tonight, the tent maker and also apostle, says in 2 Corinthians 2.9, and I've always liked this verse, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has mind conceived what God has prepared for those who loved him. In other words, what can you think of that heaven's like? What can you conceive? What can you possibly imagine? How big is your imagination? God says, no matter how much you can imagine heaven, it's not enough. It's more than what you can imagine. It's the greatest place you ever see. And it's a real place of where you are going to live. We were at a district convention, and ourselves and our representative, who's here tonight, Mr. Elroy Olson, thank you for being here. We uh, were there and we heard some great speakers in their convention. We had our elections. We voted on different things. But one man who was a pastor in Palestine, yes, a Christian Lutheran Missouri Synod pastor who was from Palestine, had a real interesting way of looking at things because he knew that his life was constantly <laughs> in danger. I don't know how you feel about that. If your life was always in danger. But he had, was very powerful in what he said. He, he had talked to a woman whose two sons were killed by ISIS. And I'm talking about horribly killed. I guess we're all adults here tonight. No chua, one child. But it was a horrible death. Two children. And just killed. And the pastor said this to that woman. What would you do to these people who had killed your children? And he was shocked. I was shocked. He said, I would invite them in for a meal. And I would take care of them. Because they had brought my children to heaven. I don't know if you think the world like that. To think that the world's so temporary that it was a good thing to be in heaven now. I wonder how we'd feel about that. And yet there it is, the promise of eternity. The place where I 
know we would all enjoy to be. A place, I think, where we'll find a lot of interesting kind of wonders. <laughs> well, the first wonder is that we'll see that we're there in heaven. The second wonder, I think, that we'll find out is there are some people we thought weren't going to be in heaven who actually are. There'll be a third wonder of those people we thought were going to be there, but, huh, where'd they go? A real place, by the way. And a place where you don't have some of the things you have here in the world. There's no hospitals there. Why? No one ever gets sick. You have perfect health. Ever thought about what that would be? How about all of you who, who wear glasses, like I do, because print is getting smaller the older you get? You will not have to wear them because your eyesight's going to be 20 20. You find there are places there in heaven that are going to be great, but there are some things you will not find as well, besides hospitals. In heaven, there is no cemetery. Why? Because no one ever gets old and no one ever dies. That is something. To the eternal youth. To be in a place where your brace expectations of how you should be. Maybe you want to be a huge muscle man. Maybe you always thought you should be the beauty princess that, that, that won all the time. This place called heaven is just beyond what you can imagine. And no physical problems. In a place without sin. Imagine that. No motives that people have which are unseemly. No anger. No violence. No trouble. A place that's filled with eternal joy. An eternal peace that the world cannot give. An eternal life. And you, God's believing child, you'll be there. <laughs> and I like this verse from Revelation 3, 5. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes. And I will not blot out your names out of the book of life. But I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. And I like this story. It's a story about the Rogers. They're a devout Christian family. They built a strong family, and the father had an interest in the spiritual condition of each of his children. And he'd quiz them to know if they were certain of their salvation. And occasionally he would ask them to share their known words about their relationship with Jesus. And one day it was seven-year-old Jimmy's turn to express how he knew about eternal life. And Jimmy told them this version. I think it's going to be something like this in heaven. One day... When we all get to go to heaven, there's going to be a time for the big angel to read from that big book. All the names of the people will be there. And he's going to come to the Rogers family. He's going to say, Daddy Rogers. And Daddy's going to say, here. And then the angel's going to call out, Mommy Rogers. And Mommy's going to say, here. And the angel will call out to Susie Rogers. And Mavis Rogers, and they'll both say, here. And they paused, and he took a big, deep breath, and he said, and finally the big angel's going to read my book name in the book. He's going to say, Jimmy Rogers. And because I'm little and he might miss me, I'm going to jump up and down and shout real loud, here, here, here. And he's going to know I'm there. <laughs> well, in a few days later, there was a tragic accident car came and actually struck down little Jimmy Rogers as he was making his way to catch the school bus. And he was rushed by ambulance to the hospital and all the family was summoned. He was in critical condition. And the family group gathered around the bed in which Jimmy now lay with no movement, no consciousness, no hope for recovery. <laughs> the doctors had done all that was in their power. And Jimmy probably was going to be gone by morning. So the family prayed and they waited. And late in the night, the little boys seemed to be stirring a bit and they all moved closer. 
They saw his moves, his lips move, and just one word was all that he said before he passed on. And one word he said of comfort for the grieving family, in a clear, small voice of a little boy, loud and clear enough that all could hear and understand, he said, here. And then, there in the life beyond, there was a big angel reading the names of all those who are written there. Here. Well, dear friends, I pray that when we come to that time, we'd say here as well. After all, it's an earthly tent. Can't live here forever. And Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, prepares for us an eternal inheritance. I pray, dear friends, we'd all be able to say here when we come to the other side. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds at one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Amen. An offering for the Lord will now be received. Please rise. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And together, let us pray. Almighty God, in your mercy, guide the course of this world so that your church may joyfully serve you in godly peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord God, Heavenly Father, 
Remind us all that we are in an earthly pilgrimage and that heaven is our home. Grant to us confidence that our salvation has been purchased for us by Jesus Christ and by his blood. Remind us then, always then, to believe in him in both good times and in bad, that we would be faithful even to the point of death and so receive the crown of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are in need of strength and comfort and healing. We pray for Mandy Bloom and Wilmer Burmeister and Roger Koopmans, for Betty Shaw and Patty Stonehouse, and all those we name in our hearts before you. O oh Lord, grant to these people your healing touch and be with them, and grant to them your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for our military and support personnel. O oh Lord of hosts, stretch out your almighty arm to strengthen and protect those who serve in the armed force of our country. Support them in times of war and in times of peace. Keep them from all evil. Grant them courage and loyalty, and grant that in all things they may serve with integrity and with honor, and bring them home safely again to their family and friends. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, as we celebrate Father's Day on June 21st, we give you the thanks for the fathers of which you provide for us. Lord, as they have been called to this office, we pray that you would strengthen them with your wisdom and with your power. And that, Lord, we give you thanks for our fathers on that special day. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray for the family and friends of Cecil Bull, who died on June 14th, whose, whose memorial service will be held Saturday, June 27th, 10 o'clock at Trinity. Be with this family and remind them of your comfort and of your aid, that you are the resurrection of life, <laughs> and that you would be with them, O oh Lord, and for all those who are grieving, that you would remind them of your comfort and of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for Earl Young as he celebrates his 80th birthday on June 25th. <laughs> be with Earl as you have given him this current length of days in this world, and bless him with many more years of life and happiness in you. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of holy marriage and of matrimony. We pray for Kelsey Lee and Charles Meyer, who are joined in marriage, that you would bless them as you were there at the wedding in Cana and Galilee. Bless them that they would serve you and that they would love one another all their days. That you would be also with Rick and Lynn Schaefer as they celebrate their 38th wedding anniversary. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of marriage. And we pray you would strengthen that institution of which you have called people to be in, as it is truly the union of one man and of one woman. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for the family and friends of the victims of the recent church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina. Lord, be with this, these people, and Lord, they have suffered so much. Be their comfort and be their rock and grant them your power. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for the Christian Holocaust in the Middle East that would come to an end. Lord, be with your people. And as so many are dying for the faith, we pray that you would be with them as they confess you as Savior and Lord. In a world that's hostile to you, be with them, O Lord, and remind them that you will confess your own before your Father in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we pray for our missionaries. We pray for Don and Pam and Eric and Doreen. We pray for the, the Wasmans who are serving in Korea. Lord, we pray that you would be with them as they continue to do your work. We pray that many people who hear of your message would come to believe in you as the way of the truth and the life, and they would be baptized to your name most holy. Lord, in your mercy. No God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace that the world cannot give. That our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs> Bless the Lord. 
in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated. I give to you the announcements. Of course, there are more inside the Trinity Weekly, but here we go. This first one, handwritten and of importance. If you brought a dessert for the free community lunch, your pen is on the counter in the fellowship hall. Thank you for all the delicious desserts. That one I'll first give you. Second announcement. The service of ordination installation for Pastor Paul Rieger will be 5 o'clock, the 21st, which as you guess is Sunday afternoon. A shower of gift cards to welcome Pastor and Mrs. Rieger to our congregation. The fareable is requested. Gift cards from various businesses, chamber dollars, monetary gifts, and especially script from FOS would be welcome. Next announcement, please sign up to help man the Trinity Fair booth, July 21st to the 26th. This is a wonderful outreach and evangelism opportunity to the community. Third announcement, a benefit burger basket dinner and bake sale will be held for Jill, let's see if I get this right, Rosette Kan, Kan, Kanopka, is that right? On Saturday, June 27th, from 4 to 7, the Knights of Columbus in Faribault, Jill was diagnosed with breast cancer in the year 2014. Ah, a special thanks to our fathers. Fathers will get a special gift as a Father's Day of Remembrance from Trinity. Ushers will hand them out the end of each service. Ooh, what kind of gift is that? Now we have the last announcement, which I'm sure you've been looking for. And that's this. We had a convention in St. Paul, and I, of course, ran for various offices. One of the vice president positions, I, I ran also for board of directors. Ran for a board of regents of Concordia St. Paul, which is probably the best one, because I came down to five rounds, and finally I lost to somebody. Not by much, I, I did lose all the time. But that's okay, it makes the other people feel better. It shows that I was willing to run. And my mother told me that even if you don't win, you have to be nice to people. <laughs> now you may wonder what you could do for me in such a desperate and non-consolable state. The answer, dear friends, is pie. <laughs> and once again, in the back of the church, they'll be selling pie and perhaps he will think of me. In the meantime, we have our last hymn, Renew Me, O Eternal Light, 704.
We thank you for joining us for this service from Trinity Lutheran Church. We're located at 530 Northwest 4th Street in Faribault, Minnesota. Today's service, again, was a recording of our Saturday evening, the June 20th service, as our service Sunday morning that you'll be listening to here, of course, will be at 10 o'clock at our church. We invite you to join us here at 10 o'clock for our polka service. It'll be the only service we have at Trinity today. Tonight, you listen to our pastor, Michael Nerva, who spoke on spending eternity with God based on 2 Corinthians 5. Our organist was Barb Morosco. You can visit us at www.trinityradioandvideo.org where you can see our services and see links to other uh, church offerings. We also invite you to contact us at Trinity Radio Club, 530 Northwest 4th Street, Fairboat, Minnesota, 55021. You can email us at tr info at trinityradioandvideo.org, and you can call the church office at 507-331-6579. Our services are each, each Saturday evening at 5.30 p.m. and each Sunday morning at 8 and 10, and 10 a.m. here at the church with our 8 o'clock service, of course, right here on KDHL. So until next Sunday at 8 a.m., we return you to downtown studio of KDHL.